ghostly apparitions, UFOs, and aliens, and mysterious creatures lurking in hidden depths around us. These are the mysteries which baffle, yet pique our curiosity. Will we ever prove their existence? Welcome to Paranormal Experienced Radio. Listen as your host and seasoned researcher, Cat Hobson, discovers new evidence, bringing us closer to the truth with informative guest interviews, the latest paranormal news, investigation advice, and equipment tips. Cat is a lead investigator with SCARE, located in Birmingham, Alabama, and feels that her gifts were given to aid individuals in distress in what should be their safe environments. Now, here is your host of Paranormal Experienced Radio, Cat Hobson, on WGOG Digital Broadcasting. Welcome to Paranormal Experience. I am your host, Kat Hobson, and man, do I have a wonderful show lined up for tonight. Before we get to that, I know all of y'all are just ready for Andrea, and who isn't? She is one of the best humans on the planet. But I want to share with y'all something that happened this morning, because I don't think this message was just for me. I got a call, or actually a message, from my friend, Kim White. And Kim is a psychic. She, you probably heard her on the show. She lives in Phoenix. And the message was, I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning with you on my heart. Are you okay? Well, I don't get those much. <laughs> I responded and said, you know, I'm not quite centered. I'm having a little bit of a struggle focusing to get my chakras and my balance right. And I think it's just this Mercury retrograde thing. It doesn't usually bother me, but man, I'm slammed. And she said, well, are you open to some insight? And I said, well, of course, duh. So she shared with me that there was a male energy with me, that he was concerned for me and caring, and that she was seeing a tree by a brook or some sort of water, a lake or something. And he was wanting to let me know that he was, with me and supporting me. And I said, wow. She said, I think that you know who he is. And if you will talk to him, he will help you. He's worried or, or concerned and caring for you, not worried. And so um, I did talk to her and explain to her that I had planted a tree for my dad along a river in Cherokee, North Carolina. And that when I got there, for Thanksgiving this year, it had died or it looked dead. Um, I was really upset and blown away by that because I felt that was a tribute. And when we were talking, she was very emphatic that the tree that she saw was thriving. I should go back and check it out and just, you know, whiten up Lucy kind of a thing. But... She also said that dealing with that, dealing with the sadness and dealing with <coughs> the angst was how you get through things like that. And it dawned on me that there's so many people who hurt during this season. And, you know, we we hear about that all the time. There's depression and there's angst. This is my first Christmas without my dad around. Um and I'm actually okay with that because he wouldn't want to be here as he was. And I know he's better. And, you know, when I see people on Facebook and other social media talk about how depressed they are and how sad they are, I'm like, reach out, find someone. Life is too short to carry this much pain just by yourself when there are other people who really care and really want to help you. Even if you don't think so, okay, I'm not going to stay on the soapbox long, but I just felt that I needed to share this because, you know, I've been depressed. I've been in dire straits. I have never felt like I wanted to check out. I've always wanted to stick around and see how the movie ends, okay? If you're not feeling that that's your mindset, there are so many resources and so many people who care. And 
please find one. Go for a walk in the park and smile at someone. If you can't be with your family, make one. Have a friend. Come over. If you don't feel that you have a friend, again, go to the park and smile at someone. Talk to someone about their dog. Just reach out somehow because you know what? You are so special. There's a reason you're here and people love you and care about you, even if you don't feel like it. Get there. Take care of you. And you know what? Again, that message wasn't just for me today. So whoever you are that needed this also, I hope that you can can find a way to work through this. Because you know what? I care. And if you need to, you can reach out to me. I'm on Facebook. If you're listening to this, you saw me. So please just reach out. Because you know what? I'm here. Now, to get to one of my favorite people. Andrea Perrin is a friend. But she is also a haunting an extreme haunting experiencer. Um, for those who may not know, she and her family lived through the experience that they created The Conjuring about. And she wrote her own version, House of Darkness, House of Light, which is a trilogy, and it's brilliant. Get it on Amazon. You will never regret reading that book. those books. She also wrote a brilliant novel, and it is so freaky. You've got to read it. She read it with George Lopez, who is her partner on um, the radio program and just a fantastic person in his own right. The book will blow your mind. And I'm not kidding. And she's also heavily involved with Gaia, which is just fantastic. We're going to learn more about that in case you somehow don't know about that. You will by the end of the night. And something that I find really amazing, because I have no idea how you do it, and it seems so complicated, is that she's writing a screenplay of House of Darkness, House of Light. And please welcome my friend, Andrea Perrin. Hi. Hi, Kat. It's so great to be with you tonight, sweetheart. Oh, I'm thrilled that you're here. We haven't talked in way too long. I know. And, you and- know, usually we manage to at least catch up with each each other personally. Yes. Even if we're not on the air. And it's just been such a crazy year uh, for me. Um, It began in January with the loss of my dog. And then came the loss of my friend, John Lento. And then in March, my baby sister died. And then in April, her best friend died because she couldn't live without her. And on and on, I had six losses in the first six months of this year uh, to the point where I was, you know, pounding my fist at the universe saying, enough, Mm -hmm. enough, enough. I can't take any more loss. We can't take any more loss. You know, it was it was um, it split me wide open. It fractured my heart. Uh, People ask me all the time how I'm doing. And the honest answer is I cannot believe that my heart kept beating when my sister stopped. I know. And I knew that when it happened. And I just know. And, you know, y'all aren't just, I mean, you're not just sisters. Y'all are, y'all are, y'all share spirits. Yes. And, you know, it's, when that happened, I was just so stunned and it was, I knew how hard that was. Well, you know, I use the opportunity now whenever I do any radio broadcasts or any television broadcasts to let people know that my sister died needlessly. All she did was take the medication that was prescribed to Mm -hmm. for her by her surgeon uh, the the morning after she died she was supposed to have surgery uh, for a, a compressed disc in her neck and this was supposed to mitigate the pain um, that she was in substantial pain prior to the surgery and and um, we were all afraid that it was going to be a difficult surgery 
but none of us expected that we would lose her while she was sitting up watching TV. Right. You know, and she, um, uh, April had a, a hard life, uh, and it doesn't even matter that some of it was her own making. Um, she had uh, a really hard row to hoe in this life. And in some ways, I think, we're, we're partially relieved that she's out of pain. Um, she had uh, degenerative spinal disease and she was literally, uh, her, her bones were literally crushing into each other. She uh, really struggled with pain and she struggled with prescription drugs, but there was nothing that she did wrong in terms of taking her medication. It was the medication that was wrong. And 19 people a day are dying from a toxic cocktail of yeah. oxycodone and fentanyl patches. And that's what killed her. And I'm here to tell everyone with an earshot that if you are using these drugs, and particularly if you are using these drugs together, I'm here to tell you, to forewarn you right now, that they will make you feel better until they kill you. And the government will do absolutely nothing about this because Congress is owned by the powers that be, including Big Pharma, including the American Medical Association, including the gas and oil industry, et cetera, et cetera. They will do nothing to stop this. So if you're hearing a lot of lip service about the drug, the war on prescription drugs and, and, um, and the uh, epidemic of opioid use in this country, please believe me when I tell you that it is absolutely nothing but lip service to make you shut up and go away. Nothing will be done about this. We must self-regulate our, ourselves and those that we love because no one's got our back on this. No one does. So please Heed my words, heed my words. If you know anybody, there are drugs on the market that will perform the same task and mitigate the pain without becoming, without you becoming addicted or without your life being at risk. So that's, that's what I have to share with your listening audience tonight. And really the most important thing that I could tell anybody, because if one life cat, if one life is saved, because I, to I chose to speak out about the way my sister died, then she will not have died in vain. Do you know what? What? I absolutely share your opinion on that topic, and I am just really more than happy to provide a platform for you to share that, because I lost a friend to heroin, and it was really quite a shock because, you know, we're grown ups. That's not supposed to happen. Right. Right. But um, to see someone who is going through it while medically supervised is just absolutely breathtaking. And I cannot imagine, as I said, I know how close y'all are. I, I can't imagine knowing that I mean it breaks my heart and it breaks my heart to hear your voice because I know that with the pain and the anger the heart's still broken yeah and you know I love you I love you too sweetheart you've been such a good close friend to me for so many years I mean back when no one even knew who I was or what message I was bringing into the world uh, and for that, I will always be grateful. And I'll always be that friend. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very comforting thing to know. Well, it's the reverse is true as well. Yes. You know, you have been so supportive of me and so kind to me. And, you know, kindness matters way more than most everything else. It does. And it's it's a it's a high ticket commodity lately because it's tough to find sometimes, but it's there. Oh yes, it's there. It's absolutely there. You know, most human beings are 
are the epitome of, of kindness and love and generosity of spirit. Most human beings are so good. Yes. And all they want, all they want is to, you know, to live a good life and to you know, give their, ch- their children a chance to live an even better one. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's a very simple request, really. Um, and um, I find that, you know, I mean, we might have our differences on topics and politics and, and everything else, but I really do believe that the vast majority of human beings are good to the core. I do. I do, too. You know, my dad used to tell me that I was way too old to be that damn naive. (laughs) And I'm like, he told me I was way too old to be that damn naive. And I said, really? Because aren't you the guy that voted the green ticket all your life Mm -hmm. just to try to help them be on a on a ballot? I don't think that you have any business telling me I'm that naive. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's just it's not naive. It's reality i always assume that people are going to be the way i am until they prove me differently yes and you know i was reading a a friend's post about how you know she wasn't going to be nice anymore she had been used and abused and stuff that's what i'm talking this season which is joyous for most people can be so harsh for others and it's it's a different experience for me just like for you this year you know i mean it is it just is yeah and i am one of the most positive people i know 98 percent of the time and it's just hard to to cope with that but you know i just think it's so important that if you're feeling, you know, we have a mutual friend on Facebook who reached out and said, you know, I'm coping with a hard depression. If you could pray for me. Absolutely. Or, you know, send positive vibes, whatever you believe. And it's like, absolutely. You know, you don't even have to ask. That happens all the time anyway. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know? it does. And we lift each other up. You know, I have a, a fan page on Facebook um, mm-hmm. that some of my friends started uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, uh, <clears throat> and asked me if I wanted a fan page. And I said, yes, as long as it's made clear that the fan page is for for the people who I'm a fan of in life, you know, the ones that have, have been there for me and who are, are friends that, you know, just want another forum to express themselves more openly. So we have this little intimate space. It's a wonderful uh, space. Yes, uh, as you well know, called the Buttercup Brigade. And we are the spiritual warriors and the good deed doers and the rose-colored glasses wearers Mm -hmm. uh, who, who truly in our heart of hearts believe that we can lift the vibration of the planet with love and bringing joy and tenderness and sweetness into the world and that uh, we we work in tandem together. Whenever someone has a crisis, they post it, and everybody mm-hmm. pitches in to help. You know, it's it's um, brilliant. It's an intimate group of a thousand and thirty people. <laughs> <laughs> it is absolutely brilliant. You know, we are up against our first break, and I am just so my heart. My heart is so filled right now. Thank you so much. And Tracy and Susan Todd are saying hello, too. Oh, I love it. Talk is our business. And business is good. WGOG Clearwater. Let's talk. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has delivered a -a one-of-a-kind reading experience, covering everything from psychics, UFOs, paranormal investigations, and more. To subscribe, visit fatemag.com or call 828-702-3032. That's 828-702-3032. Subscribe and find your true reports of the strange and unknown at FateMag.com. 
Marcella Zinner. Named one of the best intuitive psychics of Tampa Bay, Marcella is ready to change your life. Being a clairvoyant since childhood, Marcella enhanced her natural gifts with a master's degree from the College of Metaphysical Studies and ongoing advanced studies at the Edgar Casey Foundation. Marcella's passion is to share her gifts with you. With intuitive counseling, past life regressions, Reiki, and empowering workshop events. What are you waiting for? Call 727-785-8780. That's 727-785-8780 to schedule your life-changing appointment with Marcella. Marcella Zinner, intuitive counselor and clairvoyant. Find your answers at MarcellaZ.com. Nothing feels better than a good cleanse to wash away the day. If you think that refreshes you, then experience the ultimate cleanse with Soaps by Susan. Cleansing Spiritually LLC uses only pharmaceutical-grade essential oils, all-natural shea butter, coconut oils, and vitamin E, and tailored toward the ultimate cleanse. Susan uses a skin-safe fragrance with an aroma that brings a smile to your face and takes you to that happy place within. Each bar is handcrafted and custom to order so it not only cleanses the soul but also matches your room's decor. Cleansing Spiritually Soap makes great gifts or you can just indulge yourself for a spiritual cleansing you'll never forget. You want some now, don't you? We thought so. Contact Susan Todd to place your custom order at facebook.com slash spiritually. Don't settle for clean. Get spiritually clean at facebook.com backslash spiritually. We pause for station identification. It's the little cinder block building on the north side of town with the towel behind it. WGOG DB Let's talk. Twenty-four minutes after the hour, and you are listening to Paranormal Experience Radio. I am your host, Kat Hobson, and I'm joined by my guest, Andrea Perrin. You know, we were talking about how the experiences of your youth are helping you through your your life experiences right now. Do you want to expand on that somewhat? Uh, yes, um, actually, you know, I... The first thing that happened um, after April passed away is that she went to Cindy, my sister Cindy, Mm -hmm. because she didn't know she was dead. uh, And Cindy had to help her. Um, But she has now, uh, since then, I mean, within, I would say within 18 hours, I had my first encounter with her and I was on the Queen Mary in California. and she made her presence known in a very big way. Um, and it, the thing that uh, I wanted to share was that, uh, well, what had happened was when I got off the airplane, it was eight o'clock in the morning Pacific time. Um, and when I left Orlando, my sister had already passed away. And I'm so grateful that I didn't feel that because I wouldn't have gone. And I needed to be with my friends for those few days to lift me up. Um, and it was um, it was just the most remarkable. I'll never forget any of it, not a moment of it. But when I got to LAX, uh, I went to call my father um, to let him know I had landed safely, which is just obligatory because he right, follows right. my flight and he knows when I've landed it's as soon as I <laughs> I've landed. Um, David does that when I travel too. Yeah, yeah, and it's just a show of love and support. Um, But I picked up the phone and there was a message from my sister, Christine, that said, call home now. And I mean, panic struck my heart. Hold on just a second. Bon Bon, it's okay, honey. Go see Mama Chris. I have a cat that's having um, (laughs) an issue. (laughs) Bonnie, my goodness, Bonnie. Um, So um, (laughs) she's there. There's just a a brief aside. There's a, a meme on Facebook that says, 
It's a cat with just looking up at you. It looks just like Bonnie. And it says, don't worry, Mom, I had to throw up, but I made it to the carpet in time. <laughs> oh, that's, that's so, so her. This is the exact noise she makes before she hurls. You know, oh. I'm like, okay, well, we, we could just get this on the radio, Bonnie. There oh, you go. God. Nothing like live entertainment. Yes, nothing quite like it. So I got uh, Chip cool. Coffee picked me up at the airport. Um, he came in roughly the same time I did, and we traveled together that day. And, oh, my God, that man and Greta Reefer and uh, Rebecca, I, I, they just lifted me up, just lifted me up and held me That's together. That's a perfect group for you oh, to have my. been with, Chip Coffee yes. and Greta. They're wonderful. Yes, absolutely yeah. wonderful. I don't I, know Rebecca, but uh, I do know them. Rebecca's wonderful too, and Greta the Great. Oh my gosh! Yes, yes um, she is. And we got to we got to the ship, and um, I had to check into my cabin, and they dragged me off to feed me dinner, and wouldn't let me pay a dime for anything. And then about nine o'clock that night, which would have been midnight Eastern time, so I was believe me when I tell you beyond exhausted, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, in every conceivable way. And I went to my cabin, and my phone uh, was riding on fumes. So I plugged it into charge, and I laid down on my bed, and I slipped into a coma. Uh, and I woke up three hours later, and my phone was charged, and I took it and put it beside me on the bed uh, because it was my lifeline to my family. Um, and at 5.30 the following morning, my phone began making noises that my phone is incapable of making. And uh, I know it very well and love it as if I had birthed it myself. Um, really, I've, rarely have I been so attached to an inanimate object. Um, I can just picture that. Uh, well, cause, I feel you know, that. It's my connection to, yes. you know, those nearest and dearest to me when I'm traveling all over the place. Yeah. And um, and so I looked at I panicked. I woke up with a start and I grabbed my phone. And thought, oh, my God, don't die. Please don't die now. Oh, my God. You know, I mean, I was offshore. I was, oh, my God, you know. And uh, uh, it had a color like a white gauze, like the color of my sheets um, across the whole surface of it. And no icons, nothing. Oh. And I, I just stared at it for a moment. And then three enormous words came onto the screen. Talk to me. And whoa, I did. I did. did. I got up and I talked to April for a solid hour um, and drank my old stale Starbucks coffee from the night before and just talked with my sister very quietly in my cabin and said everything I needed to say. And then later that day, she stole a brand new pack of cigarettes from me right out between <laughs> me and John Tenney. I had just, of course, John ran out of cigarettes, but of course, John ran out of cigarettes. Of course. And uh, was down to like two matches. Um, so I said, don't worry, I've got back stock. I always do. I, all my friends, we all smoke the same thing. And, you know, it's so I put a brand new pack of cigarettes and a brand new hippie lighter on the table between us. And we were sharing a table at the event. And he walked in front of the table, said something to me. I answered him, I turned back around, and the cigarettes and lighter were gone. Um, and um, there wasn't another human being within 25 feet of us when that happened. So she made her presence known in a big way, and she made her presence known in two very unique ways that were ultra-specific to her. Um, when April would come to visit, Mom and I would, first and foremost, if April was coming, hide the cigarettes, hide the lighters, because she'll smoke us out of house and home and steal every freaking lighter out of this house. <laughs> and then when she gets home, say she's sorry, she doesn't know how that happened. Um, and um, April, they invented Bluetooth for April. She always had a phone plastered to her face, always. She was a very social creature and had many, many friends, and she couldn't stand to not be talking to someone. 
So April came to me in very s- s- distinct uh, and unique ways. Uh, and she did with every other member of the family as well. Now, I can't tell you that had we not had the experiences that we had living at the farm, uh, growing up at the farm, knowing that spirit exists, I don't know if I would have recognized or understood the contact that was being made. But April knew that I would know Mm -hmm. that it was her that stole the cigarettes. April knew that I would know that it was her on the phone. Um, it is, uh, it's miraculous. You know, there's a, there's a part of me that feels sad for people who absolutely and utterly dismiss anything supernatural or paranormal or whatever we choose to label it, otherworldly, whatever, spiritual, um, and believe only that, you know, life is what it is. And then it's ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and that's it. And it's over. And that's not the truth of our existence. No, it's not. I don't say that as a matter of faith. I say it as a matter of knowledge. Um, And it's not that I'm trying to convince or coerce anyone of my point of view. Because honestly, Kat, if I hadn't lived through and seen what I've seen in this life, if someone else told me our story, I don't know if I would believe it or not. So I I completely understand the skeptics who have never had an experience, certainly not one that they consciously recollect, um, where they are touched by spirit from the other side or the other, you know, the nether world, however, you you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, If they've never had that experience, I can understand why they would be skeptical, although I don't understand why anyone would be cynical, but that's just me. Um, but I and do, there is a difference. I do I, want to stress that because uh, there is a huge difference. Yes, there is a huge difference. And one is very, very negative and one is very curious. Uh, they're actually practically polar opposites in terms of mindset. Um, But, you know, those that have had experiences, those that do believe, and those who have lost others close to them in their life and have been touched and have been reached out to, know what kind of comfort that is and how it was that and those moments that have just gotten me through this year. Um, I had a visit with her last week. And I posted about it because I wanted people to know that, um, you know, in hopes that it would comfort someone else um, that's reached out. And I get the most beautiful, beautiful letters from people telling me about their their experiences with a loved one who has come back to make their presence known, even in a fleeting way, even just an aroma passing through the room. Uh, You know, or just a special piece of music that plays Mm -hmm. a special time. You know, there are so many different ways uh, that, you know, the synchronicities of life. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't think there is such a thing. No, Uh, there's not. I agree with that. Things happen with purpose and reason. And if we are cognizant of that, if we are paying attention to the messages that come around us and to us, then we are graced by that presence. And it's enough to help you keep breathing when you think that you should just go ahead and lay down and die. You know, it's, I understand I've known depression in my life. I've fought through it. Um, and it's, it's, it's ugly and it's insidious and it is absolutely pervasive at this time of year. And so I think that it's important for us to discuss this topic tonight because I, I recently did a um, uh, presentation um, with John Tenney, who, by the way, was my savior, along with Chip and the, and the gang, um, that weekend uh, after April's death on the Queen Mary. And um, I lecture with John, and, and we were talking uh, to the group about, you know, life and death and afterlife. And I asked 
this room full of people. There had to be about 150 people in this restaurant. And I asked them if there was anyone in that restaurant that had never lost someone that they loved. And then I waited for a hand to go up and not one did. So I know that when I speak about this, when I open a vein and open my heart and talk about this, you know, the extremely personal pain, my pain is no different than anyone else's pain that's ever lost someone that they love dearly and they miss terribly. And, yes. you know, I do. How many empty seats are left at tables during the holidays? And, you know, even worse, how many empty homes because people can't face being there without their mate, their spouse. Yes. You know, because that house is just too big and too empty. Yeah. And, you know, I had reached out to my stepmother who has become my friend, which I value so much because we weren't. And, you know, I was like, well, what are you doing for the holidays? And she said, well, I think I'm going to go to Atlanta where my stepsister lives. Mm -hmm. And I said, I think that's brilliant and good for you. Mm -hmm. And because the, because the house is just too empty and it's the difference. My dad traveled a lot and, um, wasn't home much, but it's different being there knowing he's not coming. Yes. And that's what she is struggling with. And, you know, I am very fortunate because she allowed me to spend every day in their home with him for the last three months of his life. And she didn't have to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. She chose to to have that happen. And there was a lot of history and there had been some interference from negativity that created a, a tough environment really the first week or so and it was wonderful to be able to lay all of that aside and become a family yes and I'm so blessed that that actually happened I mean beyond compare and I wanted to ask you because I was really taken aback almost shocked because I did not go through what y'all did, but I have been an investigator for some years now and an avid researcher. My dad and I were talking the afternoon that he passed away and I just said, you know, you know what I do. And he blinked and I said, if there's any way at all for you to let me know you're okay, that's all. Just let me know you're okay. I would I would like that because I'm so sorry this is happening. I'm going to miss you. And I worry, you know. And so he blinked again and it wasn't even eight hours. I always thought that there was like a transitional time, right? But apparently it's almost instantaneous that you shift that your energy changes and you're able to reach out as you experienced with April. Yes. You know, and um, it was just bizarre. I really, really believed that that was not a possibility. Were you surprised also by the speed of the contact? Uh, not only was I surprised, I was thrilled Yes, uh, I was um, didn't appreciate the way she did it because it scared the bejesus out of me to think my phone was dying. And I was, you know, out of contact with my family when I was in the closest possible contact that I could be with my baby sister. Right. Um, uh, I was uh, really relieved more than anything to know that she was OK. And then when Cindy saw her. Um, Cindy said, uh, she was absolutely radiant. She was her best self. 
Uh, April was about as beautiful as a human being gets. Um, just absolutely gorgeous and bright and incredibly intelligent, incredibly gifted, talented beyond measure. She was an artist. She was a writer. She was a poet. She was a musician. She was a singer with the voice of an angel. I mean, April had it all. April had it all. And she used about 1% of it during the course of her life. Uh, and now, Cindy said, she is at 100%. She is firing on all pistons, all cylinders, all synapses, and is, is happy, uh, absolutely radiantly happy. She appeared to Cindy the morning of her funeral. <clears throat> Cindy woke up um, in a panic uh, very early that morning and reached over for the phone and speed dialed April to tell her not to be late for the family function. Because one of the things that was always said in our family is, my God, April, you would be late for your own funeral. Oh. And must have been thinking in those terms. Right. Dreaming. Right. And when she realized what she was doing, she just dissolved into tears and she Bless her heart weeping and she grabbed a cup of coffee in the kitchen and went out onto her back deck and she was just sitting there having a cigarette trying to compose herself and April appeared, appeared as a full body apparition directly in front of her sitting Indian style and she said to her see now I can sit Indian style too just like you and Nancy oh my goodness you know and that was April's April's spine was so it was literally collapsing into itself. Um, she couldn't travel anywhere. She couldn't really do anything um, and was terrified that she was going to be relegated to a wheelchair for the rest of her life, um, which is why she was willing to embark on such a risky surgery. Right. Um, and who knows if this, if her death was not a blessing, if, if it spared her from a life of misery you know, we don't know and we'll never know, not on this side. But, um, you know, there's nothing to be done for it. We simply have to accept and absorb this hit, uh, as does her daughter and her son and her grandchildren. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it affects so, so many people. But Cindy came to me that morning because we all traveled together to her funeral. And, you know, with tears still in her eyes, she said, she looks beautiful oh you know and if we had not as children learned to see mm -hmm. multi-dimensionally interdimensionally extra dimensionally if we had not learned at such a tender young age what to look for what to notice how to listen uh there's no yeah. way of telling if we would have been able to have these experiences with her that have brought each and every one of us so much comfort and solace in the Absolutely. Time. That's that's probably the most beautiful thing I've ever heard said about that kind of an experience. But we are up against another break, I'm sorry. And we will be back in two minutes. Of course, we didn't invent great sound. We perfected it. WGOG Digital Broadcasting. Let's talk. Grow your business. At Signorama, we offer customized solutions for signs, branding, marketing, and advertising. We have a full range of custom sign and graphic services to meet your needs, build your brand, and create your image. Look around and you'll see how our specialists help businesses enhance their visibility and get noticed. Let us work with you to understand your unique marketing goals and help you reach them. Signorama, the way to grow your business. Meet with an expert at your local Signorama or visit us online anytime. Depression, anxiety, and insomnia can cause a lot of heartache and stress in a family or group of friends. And those heartaches only multiply when the symptoms are a byproduct of a bigger health concern, like cancer, PTSD, Parkinson's, or drug and alcohol dependency. 
And in the past, treatments for depression, anxiety, and insomnia were only moderately effective. But now there's a new therapy called Nexalyn. Nexalyn is a simple medical device that stimulates the midbrain. Nexalyn is safe and an effective FDA-cleared drug-free treatment for depression, anxiety, and insomnia with no serious side effects. And Nexalyn is proven effective in reducing symptoms in over 80% of patients treated. For information and a free confidential consultation, call 847-865-3216 or visit NexalynRelief.com. That's 847-865-3216 or visit nexelandrelief.com Families affected by disasters urgently need support. Help the American Red Cross provide meals and shelter to those affected by disasters big and small. Donate to Red Cross Disaster Relief. Go to redcross.org or call 1-800-RED-CROSS Others say it. We, 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 we prove it. WGOG Digital Broadcasting Let's Talk Forty-seven minutes after the hour, and you are listening to Paranormal Experience. I'm Kat Hobson, and I am joined by my friend Andrea Perrin. And Andrea, the the experiences that you've been sharing are so intensely personal, and I know that you're doing this to help others who are coping with their own losses and their own change of life as they come into a difficult time to cope with that. Um. I appreciate that because I know it's tough to talk about this. I know how close y'all are as a family. And I think that the most beautiful gift was seeing her. Seeing her in all her radiant glory. Able to do the things that she couldn't do anymore. I mean, it it gives you hope. Yes, it does. It does. It does, and you know, it's it's uh, <clears throat> so many people think that uh, our experience was some kind of mass hallucination or you know figment of our imaginations or you know, and and I I, I still don't know exactly what it is right. we experienced at the farm, but I know what it's not, uh, and it's not those things. It's spirit is real, um, and just because not everyone can have that experience. Although I think if they were open to it, perhaps everyone could. Um, it, it doesn't even matter. I know what I know. It's not a matter of faith or a matter of belief for me. It's a matter of knowledge for me. Um, and that's not something that I can impart with an expectation that it will be uniformly accepted across the board. Uh, but I, I do feel compelled to speak my truth. And, you know, for me, um, silence is tacit approval. If I know something or see something that I perceive to be important to the world, I have to share it. Uh, You know, 10 years ago, I didn't have, I really didn't have a venue for my message. The message hasn't changed, but the venues certainly have. And um, I'm so grateful and humbled that what I've had to say, just me, just Annie, um, has resonated with so many people. You know, we're living in a particularly difficult, chaotic time um, on planet Earth. Yes. But we're here with a very specific purpose and reason. Um, and, you know, what we perceive to be the shredding of our society, the divisions and the vitriol and the hatred and the lunacy and, you know, that all that's going on and not just in our own country, but around the world um, makes people feel uh, very uneasy, uh, very insecure. Um, And what I want to impart to people is that um, this is the restructuring uh, this is not the end of, right. of one thing, but but really a divine beginning. 
um, where when all of this settles down and the dust finds its place on the floor, we're all going to be better off. Uh, Our country will survive this. Our democracy will survive this. The world um, will survive this. Uh, But we will all be profoundly changed. And we're living at this time for a very specific reason. Yes, we are. Uh, this is uh, the this is the engagement of humanity with our universal brethren. This is spiritual ascension. This is a wave of consciousness raising that is happening across the planet. We are talking about and dealing with things that we have ignored. Um, societally and, 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 and as a world race for far too long that we are now confronting and dealing with. And there's, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, Stephen King has been um, criticized for making things in his writing a little too simplistic, you know, good versus evil, love versus that, that's fear. Right. Um, that's life. And uh, my message is the same as his. I just do it a little differently. Um, he writes about, he creates fictional characters, and I speak the truth mm-hmm. about living, breathing people who have experienced something that um, is life altering. And, you know, my mother once said a long time ago um, that she was proud of me for doing what I needed to do to tell our story because when she laid her hand on my shoulder and kissed my head, she said, because Annie, this is not the kind of story that one should rightfully take to the grave. And she was right. Yes, she was. And, you know, you had a quote. I I copied a quote of yours that said, people wondered why you stayed at the house. Mm-hmm. And y'all stayed at the house because you truly believe y'all were supposed to stay there. You were supposed to get through this experience. And when you did, and when you got to the point that you could, you shared it more fully than most people ever would have thought to. Mm-hmm. And I think that I think that your mother was totally right. Yeah. And, and I think you were too. Well, you know, another thing that she said when I was, uh, there were about, I don't know, at least five of us together uh, early, early on when I had first begun writing the books. And I had, I think I had three and possibly, no, I had all four sisters and my mother because we had Nancy on speakerphone. And we were sitting around the table right in the room where I'm sitting now. And I was taking copious notes. I was writing as fast as I could possibly write because I wanted to capture what my sisters were saying verbatim. I wanted you know, to literally make sure that I, I didn't miss any aspect of what they were sharing, any detail of it. And all of a sudden, my mother said, whoa. And she put her hand on my hand and made me stop writing for a moment. And I could tell that she had just been struck by a notion. And what she said was, you know, it's amazing. We tried to, let me get this exactly right. It's amazing to me that we spent 30 years trying to bury our dead. And when it came time to exhume them, how incredibly close to the surface they were buried. Wow. Because it was pouring out of us pouring out of us you know the tears were pouring out of us the recollections were pouring out of us I don't know how I got those books written I don't know it's all a blur to me it's seven years of blur uh, working incessantly incessantly living on coffee and cat naps and and just you know my poor sister Christine oh my god what she put up with you know it was it was uh, it was a difficult and a very trying time it was cathartic it was healing it was cleansing it was infuriating um 
You know, there were so many things that uh, my sister's at first did not want to talk about. And there were actually stories that we all know about that happened in that house that my sisters asked me not to include in the trilogy. And, and of course I uh, did abide by their wishes, right. whether it was, you know, that that story was too intense or if it was just too personal or, you know, it, <laughs> they were too dramatically affected by it. Um, and yet now over the years, um, Cindy, has given me permission. Christine has given me permission to set to tell some of uh, the most intimate um, family stories in the screenplay. So, for all intents and purposes, our entire truth, whether it be in literature or on the written, or in the written word or on the silver screen, um, the whole world is going to know what happened to our family in an organic and authentic way that no one in Hollywood gets to tamper with or use that famous phrase, creative license on, mm. which is just a nice way of saying, we're going to lie about this now. Yes. Um, you know, and I told the company that I'm working with, the people that I'm working with who are wonderful, uh, you know, this is this is a no-go if, if I don't have complete control over the manuscript because um, there's no point in telling another fictionalized version of events of our story that's been done. So how about we give the viewing public uh, credit for their innate intelligence and their ability to understand and absorb this kind of information? Um, you know, most human beings on some level are fear-based carbon units Yes. And even the brass at Warner Brothers uh, was terrified to tell our true story. There's not a single scene in The Conjuring that is from my books, not one. So because they decided to go the way that they did, and even when the screenwriters attempted to integrate uh, the truth into the screenplay, it was sent back over and over and over again. Oh, and my goodness. Yeah, seven times they sent the screenplay back seven times and said, tone this down. We're, um, we're uh, trying to get a PG-13 rating here, and this will scare people right out of the theater. What's the point of making a movie that no one sees to watch till the end? So or Big gravy. Much, you know, and, and I think that that's, that was just their own fear talking and that it was just easier for them to go with what is considered Hollywood formula mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, you know, the method they came up with was, uh, very effective, you know, it was effective because, you know, I'm an empath. I can't watch that, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. you know what? We are up against our news break at the top for the hour. We are going to be gone for five minutes. And we will pick this up because this is fascinating. So y'all join us. Enjoy the news. Hope it's good. And we will catch you on the flip side. Of all the radio stations in the world, we're one of them. WGOG Digital Broadcasting. Let's talk. Tax reform. I'm Lee Silicera, Fox News. President Trump has been calling it a Christmas present for the middle class. The tax reform bill is ready for his signature. Fox's Steve Rappaport has this live. Lisa, the president basked in the glow of victory while celebrating with Republican lawmakers at the White House. We are making America great again. You haven't heard that, have you? House Speaker Paul Ryan addressed the skeptics, telling Fox News this evening that the benefits speak for themselves. When people see the withholding go down, when they see more money in their paychecks, when they see all these announcements of all these investments, when they see these bonuses as a result of tax reform, that's the result that we expect. That's the result that we're getting. The legislation also repeals the Obamacare individual mandate. Lisa? Steve, Democrats say the measure is a lump of coal. Today, the House Republicans are cheering. They're toasting uh, the, the fact that they raise taxes on 86 
million American families, middle class families. House Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi. Normally by this time lawmakers would have left town for the holidays, but they're sticking around trying to come up with a plan to fund the government. But the plan they're working on will just get the government through about another month. But it seems like Republicans are going to have to go it alone. Democratic lawmakers got an email from Nancy Pelosi telling them to vote no on a continuing resolution to fund the government. That means Republicans are going to have to do it themselves. So they are meeting tonight in a conference room underneath the Capitol trying to figure out if they can unite the multiple factions of the party to make it happen. Fox's Peter Ducey at the Capitol. Texas Republican Blake Farenthold's name won't appear on the 2018 primary ballot after Democrats tried unsuccessfully to leave his name in place. Democrats argue his name should have to remain on the ballot since he missed the deadline for candidates to withdraw. Fox News, fair and balanced. Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites with just one click. Then their powerful technology officially matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate through the site within one day. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, our listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash newscast. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash newscast. One more time to try it for free, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash newscast. A rising country star busted for DUI and drug offenses. Michael Ray has been arrested on DUI and drug charges. I want to kiss you in the parking lot. The rising country star who had the hit Kiss You in the Morning in 2015 crashed his Jeep into the car in front of him at a McDonald's drive through in Florida. The arrest report states that Ray told investigators while waiting for his food, his foot slipped off the pedal of his 2012 Jeep. Police on the scene wrote that the country singer had bloodshot eyes and slurred speech. Officers found a glass bottle with brown liquid in his vehicle. Ray told them it was weed oil. He's being held on $6,000 bond. Michelle Polino, Fox News. The ex-wife of former NBA player Lorenzen Wright fighting authorities attempts to extradite her from California to Tennessee where she's charged with killing him in 2010. Shara Wright is due back in court in two weeks. The owner of an Indiana hotel facing a lawsuit after a woman posted a negative review online after his stay in March of last year. The beds and the linen and everything looked like it had been used and dirty. Katrina Arthur is asking for reimbursement from Abbey Inn and Suites owner Andrew Shukalay. The suit claims the Nashville, Indiana Hotel violated the state's Deceptive Consumer Sales Act by charging guests if they posted negative reviews and didn't inform management about problems during their stay. She says she tried to get in touch with hotel employees but could never find anyone and says she got a call from the hotel's attorney. He claims that he's no longer the owner-operator of that hotel. A Missouri city hoping its Christmas stocking will make the cut for the world's largest, the red and white stocking in Sedalia, Missouri, measured at 177 feet tall for entry into the Guinness Book of World Records. They're trying to beat the record set by the city of Carrara, Italy in 2011. Members of a church sewing group started working on the stocking in early October. About two dozen children helped unroll it for the unveiling. Lee Silicera, Fox News Radio. Talk is our business, and business is good. WGOG Clearwater. Let's talk. Minutes after the hour, and you are listening to Paranormal Experienced. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I am joined by someone who is just a wonderful person. So many of y'all have been fortunate enough to get to meet her. If you haven't, make the effort. I'm telling you, this is a wonderful woman. She is a big, 
big draw when she is available for speaking. She attends paranormal conventions, and you just have to. You need to read the books, House of Darkness, House of Light, which is a trilogy. She has written with George Lopez in A Flicker, which is the historical novel that will just blow your mind. The whole concept is just Twilight Zone-ish, and I loved every word of it. And she is in the middle of writing her own screenplay for her books. And I cannot wait to get the opportunity to see those. And Annie, I just want you to know, I will definitely go see those. Oh, wow. They are a little bit more bizarre. And this is Andrea Perrin. Well, you know, it's um, the, the difficulty is that the trilogy is approximately 1,500 pages, uh, very detailed a chronicling and account of the decade that we spent at the farm. Um, it's not something that could be conceivably compressed into two hours uh, without leaving out the vast majority of the significant events which occurred there. And so uh, I'm working with a, a wonderful group of people out in um, Hollywood that are very uh, anxious and excited about having the truth uh, get out into the world because in this particular instance, the truth is actually stranger than fiction. And The Conjuring was uh, literally conjured up in the minds of two screenwriters, uh, Chad and Carrie Hayes, who did their utmost, who devoured the books, who knew the story inside and out, and who did their utmost to integrate elements of the truth into the screenplay, which was promptly rejected. Um, and they were sent back time and time again, seven times total, um, to rework the screenplay and to take the truth out of it because the uh, powers that be at Warner Brothers thought that it was just too freaky. And that it was... It is pretty freaky in all fairness. Yeah, well, yeah, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, not, not so much, you know, in retrospect, as I, I look back on it. Yes, there were things that happened in that house that were absolutely terrifying. But, um, you know, my mom is the one that um, came up with the title House of Darkness, House of Light. And the reason, and I knew as soon as she said it, as soon as she said it, I knew that it was the proper title for the books because uh, she just looked me dead in the eye and she said, because it was both. It was a, a dark decade of our existence, but it was also the most enlightening decade of our existence as a family. You know, and we all learned so much and we were all so fundamentally changed by the experience and our faith and our own personal spirituality deepened immeasurably. Um, it was um, it was supposed to happen. You know, there were a hundred reasons that we we stayed at the farm and there were a hundred reasons that we should have left. And and we stayed. I mean, we were children. We didn't have any say in the matter. Right. This was a decision that had to be made between my parents. And, you know, my father was a staunch denier of what was happening in the house for a period of time after we moved in. And it took him 40 years to admit that the reason that he was king of denial was because he was afraid. Mm -hmm. He felt completely out of control. He had placed his family in, in a dangerous situation, put his own children in jeopardy unknowingly, unwittingly. And if he accepted what was happening in the house, then I, I think that he must have thought that somehow he was to blame. Um, you know, men's minds work in entirely different ways than women's do anyway. But it was his um, his denial uh, and his disbelief in what my mother was telling him and what his own children were too afraid to tell him. Because if he didn't believe her, why would he believe us? And so we had that very interesting psychological dynamic going on as well, which was a sense of utter abandonment, um, which had to be reconciled and dealt with. And, you know, the challenges that our family faced during those 10 years would have fractured most families. Um, 
And with us, ultimately, it brought us closer together. And the person on the planet that I am closest to is my mother. Uh, there's, I mean, we're just inseparable in heart and mind. And, and I just, I want to be with her all the time and just absorb her into me because mm -hmm. she's the most fascinating, most intelligent, most beautiful, most extraordinary human being I've ever known. For her to have endured what she did over the course of that decade and the sacrifices that she made to protect her children yes. uh, are second to none. And you know, because you have devoured every word of these yes. books, you know that it was um, a, a challenge and a, a testament to her love of us. And you also likewise know that it was the cause of my parents' divorce. You know, the, I do know that. the chasm that was created between them during the time that we lived there. And it wasn't that, you know, my father in any way loved us less. He certainly loved us to the extent that he was able to love anyone. Um, but he was fear-based. And so this was just too much for him to wrap his mind around for a, a long period of time, long enough to cause a disintegration in the element of trust in yes. the marriage. And once that's gone, it's gone. Um, and so even though they stayed together and, and we moved together as a family to Georgia, except for Nancy, who refused to leave the farmhouse and made a, a caretaker arrangement with the couple that bought the house, the abutting landowners, um, you know, we never, after we lived at the farm, we never lived together as a family again, uh, in whole, in total, because by the time Nancy did eventually leave Rhode Island and come to join us in Georgia, we had all reached adulthood and we had dispersed um, and had lives of our own. So that was it, you know, our family life uh, in total was lived at the farm, um, the end of it. And yet um, the, the closeness and the way that we cherish each other, you know, and even the, the um, animosity that my parents have held on to. I mean, they got divorced in 1983. It's what, 2017, you know, and still the animus. Almost 18, is, yeah. You know, is still, and, and yet when we gathered to lay April to rest, there was a healing that took place. It was the first time in decades that any of us had seen our parents hold each other and talk to each other in a very wow. personal way. And um, I'm so grateful for that. I'm so, and I know April had something to do with it. I know she did. Oh, of course she did. She didn't want to leave them not able to do that. They needed each other. Yeah. That and was their child jointly. I know. And, and mom was, mom was just too overcome. She couldn't even attend the funeral. And so Christine had to miss it as well because somebody had to stay home with mom, uh, that day. And, but it, it all worked exactly the way that it was supposed to, you know, exactly the way that it was supposed to. And, and, um, you know, we sent her off in a blaze of glory and heartfelt love. I have no doubt, and neither would she, oh, that's no. exactly what it was. Yeah, she was there. Yeah. She was there. Everybody that was there said they could feel her around them. They could feel her. Or they could smell. She always wore the same uh, cologne, the same perfume, um, and they could, you know, catch the whiff of the scent mm -hmm. of her around everybody uh, the day of her memorial service. Um, <clears throat> it was um, actually, it was quite beautiful. Well, you know, she wasn't late. No, no, for once she was on time, bless her heart. You know, and she goes everywhere with me now. She's everywhere. Everywhere I go, April is, is with me. And I just, you know, I just say, you know what, honey, you just, you've turned into nothing but a freeloader because she couldn't, <laughs> honestly, she couldn't travel with me and she always wanted to. She couldn't even travel to the premiere of oh, The Conjuring. No. She was the only one of us of the children that missed the opportunity to go out to Hollywood and to the premiere. And she stayed here with my mom 
uh, who was unable to travel as well. So, uh, you know, there were things that April missed out on. And yet she said, you know, I sat and watched entertainment tonight with mom and there you guys were on the red carpet and she's like oh what a thrill there's my family there they are and they're talking to Annie and oh my god and you know and it was you know so it was uh it was wonderful for her too and then when um we finally came back um from California she got together with a whole bunch of her friends and went out to one of the big theaters in Atlanta to see the film herself. Um, and she was the, the belle of the ball, the star of the night, you know, and it was, fun. you know, so it was uh, something that was um, very special that she got to be a part of. And I'm so glad that she stayed with us long enough for that to happen. And I know that she will see, you know, the, it's tough when I'm writing the screenplays, you know, to, to compress and to condense those 10 years into what will be probably somewhere between six and seven hours of film um, is an incredible, enormous challenge. Uh, But the thing that's most challenging about it, and because you're a reader of the book books, you know that, uh, you know, there are vast sections of it that are written in third third person narrative where it's, it's not reliant particularly on dialogue but Mm -hmm. more description of events. Um, And so to take those events and then um, put in what I would presume or what we would presume would have been roughly the dialogue shared uh, during those particular incidents um, has been interesting. You know, we, as a family, we all know each other so well. We all talk to each other exactly the same way. There was never any baby talk in our house. Everybody was always spoken to as though they were already a full-blown adult, mm-hmm. and which is why all of us have an extraordinary command of the language because both of my parents were extremely well-educated and you know th- that got passed on to us uh, in our home life. And so uh, recreating those scenes uh, in my mind, I find myself sometimes calling upon April when I'm writing about her, which is extremely difficult sometimes, um, and asking her if she can help me, you know, honey, what do you remember uh, of your, your talks with little Oliver in the closet? And, and, you know, have I got this right? And, you know, I find myself communicating with her constantly Uh, to make sure that I'm uh, that her depiction is accurate, that I am uh, accurately reflecting what she wants um, on screen in terms of her experiences at the farm, because I don't have her on speed dial anymore. In fact, I did the same thing that Cindy did the other day. I was deeply engrossed in what I was doing and I reached over and I hit her number to call her to ask her. Um, and then realized what I was doing, you know, and it, it stopped me. It, it just gave me pause that I still feel so close to her that all these months later, I'm just assuming that this has all just been a terrible nightmare and she's on the right. other end of the line and I can just ask her if this fits this scene, you know, so. I still do I, that with my grandmother who died in 1990. Yeah. So I dial her number. So. I totally understand because, you know, that was that was my person. And with that said, we are up on a three minute break. We will be. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after these important announcements. Trust me, it's worth the wait. Ask yourself, when was the last time I took a vacation? It's been a while, hasn't it? If you're looking for a well-deserved, peaceful getaway, then look no further than Vacation Home Renter's Whitetail Lodge. Let the professionals at VacationHomeRenter.com help you with the vacation spot of your dreams, the Whitetail Lodge. This clean, cozy, and gorgeous cabin is a spacious 3,100 square foot, five bedroom, three and a half bath that is perfect for large families or entertainment. 
entertaining friends. Did I mention it comes with an outdoor hot tub? Relax with modern luxuries like central air, wood-burning fireplace, Wi-Fi, enormous covered deck, and flat-screen TVs in every room. Just minutes from Terry Peak Ski Area and other popular attractions like Mount Rushmore and Custer State Park. Don't wait another minute to book the Whitetail Lodge and stay in the vacation home you're looking for. Visit online at vacationhomerenter.com and select the beautiful Whitetail Lodge. Depression, anxiety, and insomnia can cause a lot of heartache and stress in a family or group of friends. And those heartaches only multiply when the symptoms are a byproduct of a bigger health concern, like cancer, PTSD, Parkinson's, or drug and alcohol dependency. And in the past, treatments for depression, anxiety, and insomnia were only moderately effective. But now there's a new therapy called Nexalin. Nexalin is a simple medical device that stimulates the midbrain. Nexalin is safe and an effective FDA-cleared drug-free treatment for depression, anxiety, and insomnia with no serious side effects. And Nexalin is proven effective in reducing symptoms in over 80% of patients treated. For information and a free confidential consultation, call 847-865-3216 or visit NexalinRelief.com. That's 847-865-3216 or visit at nexelinrelief.com. Haunted, a psychic story by author and radio host Ariel Grace. This is not your average book of hauntings. Haunted, a psychic story is written from a psychic perspective and contains true stories and some handy tips. Written in three parts, Haunted, a psychic story contains chilling adventures, advice from the archangels, and helpful tips used by Ariel Grace to clear haunted homes around the globe. Haunted, a psychic story is available on Amazon or you can download straight to your Kindle. Haunted, a psychic story by Ariel Grace. Get your copy today. Others say it. We, 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 we prove it. WGOG Digital Broadcasting. Let's talk. And you are listening to Paranormal Experienced. I'm your host, Kat Hobson, with my guest, Andrea Perrin. And we are discussing her books that she has been writing screenplays for, her family's experience in their home in Rhode Island, which became the basis, loosely, of The Conjuring. And, you know, we were talking about your writing and how you you lose time as you do it. I think it's, I think it's, you know, the universe's way of making sure that you don't have to stop. Yeah. (laughs) When you lose that day, it's like, okay, in my case, I just sit the whole day. I'm just sitting there going. Yeah. And, but you know, you, you totally get immersed in your work. I do. And I often work very late at night, um, which is peaceful and quiet for Uh me. The house is shut down, you know, whether it be here in Georgia with my mom and my sister or down in Florida with my father. Uh, And I really do go back and forth between the two. Technically, I legally live in Florida now, but I'm here a lot uh, because I have to be. I mean, it's, you know, my time with my mother is I is treasured. And um, and when I'm not traveling uh, and I do travel with my father a lot. He comes with me at a lot of different events, and he's enormously helpful to me. And everybody loves him, and it's and it's it's great too because uh, when I'm getting slammed with questions and an awful lot of people at one time, they talk to him, and so they get that alternate perspective. And you know, of course, <laughs> where once he used to deny the spirits, now he denies that he denied the spirit. <laughs> Which, you know, it's like, Dad, uh, <clears throat> they all know the truth, okay? They all <laughs> read the books, Dad. You know, you might as well just admit that you were a horse's ass for a while. Uh, then he just Roger, left. never. Never. Oh, not Roger. <laughs> oh, God. But, uh, you know, um, this is uh, a very interesting time in life. You know, I... I remember on New Year's Day last 
year, this year, um, I posted a cartoon. Um, and it was uh, two figures that were planting a garden. And the garden was in the shape of 2017. And one of them asked the other uh, why it was... It, one of them says it's going to be a fabulous year and the other asked why and the response was because we're planting flowers um and you know that's been one of my metaphors for forever is you know we've got to get back to the garden you know get back to nature get back to you know what is organic and and what is beautiful and what we can create with our own hands and you know, part of my message is, you know, for us to reintegrate with Mother Gaia to mm -hmm. to, you know, come to uh, an understanding that we are the nurturers and we are the protectors and, and we are the ones that that shed love and, and beauty with our, our own hands and our minds and our hearts. And, um, you know, somebody asked me the other day about that because it popped up in a, you know, a on Facebook, a yearly uh, remembrance or something like that. And I looked at it for a moment and I never thought that um, I would spend so much of 2017 planting flowers in graveyards. Um, it was not what I expected. No. And yet it changed me. Uh, I, I thought that Prior to what I've been through this year, Kat, I thought I was probably or had to be one of the most open and loving people. It's just my persuasion. It's just how I am. It's how I've always been. Yes. I've not changed. It's 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 me uh, uh, on a fundamental level. And um, it wasn't until. I went through the events of the first six months of this year that I realized that there was a part of me that was still guarded and my heart was broken wide open, absolutely wide open. There was mm -hmm. nothing to hide. There was nothing to keep in reserve. There was nothing to not share. Um, and I have been over the course of this year, speaking very openly about the fact that we as human beings will, if we live at all, will have our hearts bloodied and mm -hmm. bludgeoned and battered and bruised and bloodied over the course of our lifetime. And in the famous, beautiful words of the poet Leonard Cohen, who uh, wrote the lyrics to a song, the the, uh, the most meaningful lyrics I've ever heard. There is a crack in everything. That's mm -hmm. how the light gets in. Yes. He is, um, he is one of my favorite. I know I miss it. It's hard to believe that, that, He's gone. It's it's hard to believe that he's gone. He left the world with so much beauty. And, you know, the most unlikely character to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just an absolutely brilliant, wonderful surprise when you would listen to what he wrote. I know. I listened to his song, Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's got, I don't know, a hundred different covers. I have my favorites. Um, but I listen to it regularly because I find it so deeply inspirational. Uh, and, you know, music has been my salvation. You know, one thing I need to share with you, and I don't know if you know this yet, Kat, um, but I have had the great good fortune to uh, come into a, a, a friendship and a wonderful association with a fabulous composer uh, up in Canada, up in Quebec. Uh, and his name is Francois Dubé. Uh, and he and I are working together and he'll be writing the soundtrack for oh, how wonderful for House of Darkness, House of Light. And right now we're working on the theme song. And I just turned over my lyrics to him in total this morning. And uh, 
Uh, then we were going to work together. And I'm like, no, wait, I got an interview tonight. Okay, talk to you tomorrow. Um, but uh, he's an absolutely lovely, lovely man and uh, uh, deeply ingrained in the paranormal, absolutely fascinated with it. Uh, he's a few years older than me, and uh, he, but we have, you know, we come from the same generation. We have a lot of the same experiences and um, and a lot to share. And it's been wonderful, wonderful uh, working with him and watching uh, our association blossom into this incredible kinship that we share. It's, it's very spiritual in nature. And um, I'm very excited about uh, the music that will come. You know, all great films must have a great soundtrack. And so not only will our soundtrack uh, be many of the songs that I write about in the trilogy, you know, the soundtrack of the 70s, mm -hmm. but um, it will also have uh, a very haunting, um, melodic, lyrical background music that I think captures the heart and the soul of the story and encapsulates the message. So I'm very excited to announce that. Well, that's very exciting. I mean... Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> you're composing lyrics. You're working with a composer to create your own soundtrack. You're just doing all the things. And yeah, you know, and that's on top of the events that you're doing, the work that you're doing with Gaia. And, you know, which actually fascinates me because I think that is one of the greatest I don't even know what you call it because, you know, you have Gaia Radio, you have the videos, it's a metaphysical, spiritual, um, alternate life form kind of supportive community. Yes, and don't forget, I've got the full backing and support of the entire galactic family. Absolutely. Who are very pleased with me and uh, make their presence known uh, virtually daily. Um, so it's um, it's fabulous because that's uh, a message that, you know, people who are involved in the paranormal, you know, I often say that the happiest people I know are obsessed with death. Um, but and that's true. You've got to admit, I mean, there's some really out there, crazy, happy people in the paranormal. But it's not even so much that they're obsessed with death, but obsessed with uh, proving that there's an afterlife and uh, the joy and the hope that comes with that. And I'm constantly reminding them to not focus completely and solely on the future, but to actually take time to enjoy the moment. Uh, yes. you know, enjoy the moment of your mental, uh, your mortality and, and use your mentality to tap into what is happening, you know, existentially in your life now as you're living it, rather than projecting forward all the time, you know, coping with a fear of death and uh, a desire to prove that there's an afterlife. Take a moment to live now and do this. Now, see, for me, <clears throat> I've known since the age of 12, as have, you know, all my other family members have known um, that there is some form of existence after mm -hmm. death. And so I've lived my whole life, uh, you know, virtually all of my adult life, um, and, well, virtually all of my life, minus the first 12 years, knowing um, that there is something. I still can't tell you exactly what it is. Uh, all these decades later, I don't know. But it, this isn't a matter of believing. This isn't a matter of religious indoctrination. This isn't a matter of authorities telling me what to think. Um, this is uh, experiential. This is based on my own eyewitness accounts, my own sensory perceptions, uh, and that also of everyone else in my family um, that puts us in a uh, unique, not solely unique, but a rather unique um, position to be able to say, yes, we do know that there's something beyond our existence. Um, but to me, the one thing, the only thing that's important, what thing is more important than knowing that we are not alone in the universe, knowing that we are loved knowing 
that there are benevolent races who want desperately without interfering with our evolution spiritually and otherwise want to lift us up so that we can survive our own self-destructive um, persuasion. You know, humanity is very, very adept at killing itself off. Uh, and it does not need to be that way. And everything that we could possibly need could be provided to us, you know, as a planet. I mean, just mm -hmm. in the United States alone, we throw away enough food every year in this country to feed the entire planet. Yeah, that is shocking and disturbing. Much and more wrong. Than, yes, and it's wrong. wrong. You know, and, and this is the paradigm shift. This is what has been uh, prophesized. This is what uh, all the spiritualists have been talking about for decades. The pagans, uh, the um, I'm sorry, the Mayans were correct. Yes. Uh, well, the pagans were correct, too, by the way. Um, but the Mayans were correct when they ended their calendar. Their calendar ended at the age uh, end of the Piscean age. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so many people at the time remember back in 2012, oh, it's the end of the world. It's the end of the world. Is that, you know, the Mayan calendar, it's over. This is it. It's over. And yes, it was the end of the world as we knew it. It was. And thus began the age of Aquarius, the water bearer. And what did the age of Aquarius bring to us but tsunamis and, you know, destruction and uh, you know, hurricanes and cyclones and typhoons and, and you know, I mean, it's here. <clears throat> it's here and it's now. And uh, Mother Gaia is really rearing up and saying, you know, look, folks, I can survive just fine without you, but you can't survive without me. Let's rethink this. Yep. You know, I mean, we are at an age and a time and let's make no mistake about it. We're all here to help initiate this in one way, shape or form or another. We are all here to play a part in this enormous shift, what I like to call the holy shift that is happening <laughs> no on doubt. this planet. Yes. Um, you know, and I get to play a little part in that. Um, and and I don't know why I've been privileged to have the experiences that I've had in my life and to see the things that I've seen and to have the interactions and the engagement that I have had, not only with spiritual entities, but with extraterrestrials. Um, but it is it is real and it's true and it's pure and it's absolutely loving and uh, I feel like I'm living a magical life that I have been, for whatever reason, chosen to have these experiences and then to disseminate them fearlessly out into the world. I am brave. I you am are brave. brave. And you are I fierce. Put my whole entire personal reputation on the line um, to tell, to speak my truth to tell what I perceive to be the truth of our existence. And I'm not responsible for how anyone uh, assimilates that information or if they dismiss it out of hand, that's entirely up to them. I am not responsible for their emotional reaction in the same way that my mother once put my father up against a wall and told him that the existence of the spirits in that farmhouse was not contingent upon his belief in them. There you go. Yep. And, you know, I find that interesting, too, because you are fearless when it comes to this. And a couple of years ago when we were talking, we were actually getting ready to um, go off the air. And I said, well, you know, you're going to have to come back. And you said, absolutely. And can we talk about ETs next time? Mm -hmm. And that was my first clue that you were as interested in that as I am. So that was actually a really neat thing. And I started looking into some of the blogs that you had written a little closer and started looking into some videos of speaking engagements that you had been on. And 
so I started recognizing, and yeah, you and I both know that we were following each other on each other, on our friends' pages, and we were constantly of the same mind, and we were hitting like after like, and I finally sent you a message and said, you know, you're going to, you're going to have to friend me because <laughs> we are just supposed to be together. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So just make it official on Facebook since Facebook <laughs> is the official home of the paranormal. But it was so, but, but I mean, because it was an easy place for us to have a conversation. Yeah. And so that's how, yeah, we started getting more in depth with our discussions. And it's interesting to me that we are on, yeah, we're, we're not on different parts of the world now, but we grew up separately like that. Mm-hmm. And yet when we became friends, you lived down the street from one of my best friends. Uh huh. It's just, a, it's yep. just a karmic kismic thing. I know. And you're only two, two hours away from where I happen to be right now, which is. I know. <laughs> it oh. is crazy. The connectivity oh, we, between us is really cool. I know. And, and we will and, definitely have time and spend time and do events together and, you know, there's no question in my mind about that. And, you know, there's nothing accidental no. or coincidental about us knowing each other and working together and and having this connection. You know, you're part of my tribe. I'm part of yours. We're totally. all coming together with purpose and reason. And the reason is because we're more powerful together. And yes. message resonates farther when we're together, when, you know, we're throwing pebbles in the pond to watch the concentric circles, when we all get together, we throw boulders in the pond and we really shake things up. And, you know, that's so very important because we have to, we have to, it's it's our mission. And I know that, you know, that word has a, a bit of a religious connotation to it, but it doesn't for me. It just means that it's my job. And right. you as well. Not as, necessarily religious. That's it's not. Right. It's it not. is it's it is a job. assignment. Yes, it is. It's just an assignment. And it's one that I take very seriously. And in a, and until a decade ago, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Um a, until a decade ago, I did not know what my job was. I knew what jobs I had done to keep a right. roof over my head and food on my table. Uh, I knew what I had done to contribute to the greater good on the planet in terms of the kind of work that I chose to do, uh, specifically when I was working with developmentally disabled people and you know, doing that kind of work, emotionally disordered children, you know, things like that. Uh, I spent a lot of years of my life working in a kind of clinical therapeutic environment um, and making whatever difference that I could in the world uh, with individuals. Um, But now I speak to people, uh, you know, by countless tens of thousands Mm -hmm. uh, and millions. And it is um, it's very humbling to me that they're interested in listening to what I have to say. Have you heard you? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, there's a reason that they're there because you are a guiding light for this experience. And we are going to discuss that further right on the other side of our final station break. So two minutes, guys. We'll be right back. We know you listen to other stations, but want to thank you for choosing Hours. WGOG Digital Broadcasting. Let's talk. There are thousands of health and beauty products on the market these days, but how many can you say are truly natural? The name says it all. And Naturally by Darla is here to humbly serve, guide, and help to heal all individuals seeking a more natural way of living. NaturallyByDarla.com provides a wide variety of products and services like essential oils, soaps, balms and salves, powerful mist, and ancient healing techniques. Curious yet? We thought so. 
and invite you to visit our website, naturallybydarla.com, or call 847-334-1580. That's 847-334-1580. Naturallybydarla.com. Humbly serving for over 10 years, naturally. Nothing feels better than a good cleanse to wash away the day. If you think that refreshes you, then experience the ultimate cleanse with Soaps by Susan. Cleansing Spiritually LLC uses only pharmaceutical-grade essential oils, all-natural shea butter, coconut oils, and vitamin E, and tailored toward the ultimate cleanse. Susan uses a skin-safe fragrance with an aroma that brings a smile to your face and takes you to that happy place within. Each bar is handcrafted and custom to order, so it not only cleanses the soul, but also matches your room's decor. Cleansing Spiritually Soap makes great gifts, or you can just indulge yourself for a spiritual cleansing you'll never forget. You want some now, don't you? We thought so. Contact Susan Todd to place your custom order at facebook.com slash spiritually. Don't settle for clean. Get spiritually clean at facebook.com backslash spiritually. We pause for station identification. It's the little cinder block building on the north side of town with the towel behind it. WGOG DB Clearwater. Let's talk. to the hour and you are back for the final segment of paranormal experience with Kat Hobson and my guest Andrea Perrin and you know we were talking about everything that's coming together and about the change the shift that took place in 2012 it wasn't going to be a computer issue it's a global issue and you know, now we have the government coming out and saying, oh, why, yes, we have been investigating these UFOs. And we're so sorry we didn't mention that before, but it was top secret. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sitting there reading it. And then I'm seeing my friends at MUFON saying, no joke, Sherlock. We've been doing this stuff for 30 years. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just like, okay, so... Pull the other one. We know you've been doing this. This isn't a secret. FBI.gov slash vault. You can go find stuff there. What do you think about all of this? What is your take on it? We've we've got 10 minutes of just any Perrin on this topic. Well, I think uh, that it's, um, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't describe it necessarily as a ruse. I would describe it as a deflection technique. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm not a huge conspiracy theorist, but I do know people that have worked in the upper echelon of this field. And I too have been in, uh, a, a ufologist before that word existed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, 30, 40 years of my life spent researching this subject, um, and making contact, conscious contact. Um, so to me, it's like, uh, yeah, well, okay, you're putting this little thing out over here, and the New York Times has got this, and then there it goes, MSNBC picked it up, and CNN picked it up, and this one picked it up, and that one picked it up, and the hosts of the shows that are interviewing the man who ran this Mm -hmm. investigation are still rolling their eyes Mm -hmm. and to reach through the plasma TV screen and wring their scrawny necks. You know, if they think they're covering their own arse by, you know, um, making fun of this topic, uh, they're in for a really, really rude awakening uh, because the fact is that we are utterly, completely surrounded. This planet, and there are those of our galactic family, our brethren, that have traveled countless light years to be here. Why? Because this is a planet in crisis. This is a planet filled with people who are self-destructive by nature, 
and who have the weaponry to blow the entire planet out of the galaxy 300 times and maniacs with their fingers on the trigger. They should be here. Someone that's adult needs to intercede in what's going on on this planet right now. We are the closest that we have been to nuclear war in 70 years. And I'm and I'm not discounting the Bay of Pigs. Right. I know that was serious. You know, I was I was just a child when that happened and paid very close attention to what was going on. I know a lot of things from incredibly reliable sources from deep inside this study. And what I know is that this little piece of videotape and pilots going, oh, what's that? I've never seen anything like that. Excuse me. That's elementary school. I'm a graduate student. And right. if you want to talk to me about this and you want to put something out, then yes, you know, this is a, a, a really lame form of disclosure as far as I am concerned. Thankfully, circ circumventing the White House, thankfully for that. I actually thought that disclosure would probably come from the Vatican. Um, but that being said, disclosure has been an ongoing process for decades, yes. decades. Yes. And we, the reliable people who you know have a voice, who have had experiences, who are contactees, who have impeccable reputations for honesty, and who have nothing to gain and everything to lose mm -hmm. by speaking the truth on this subject, we are the point of disclosure. And if the Department of Defense wants to put out you know, two minutes worth of video and say, okay, here it is. And yes, we've been studying this. They're lying. They're lying through their teeth. They've been studying this for decades and decades and decades. And more money than we can conceive of has been spent on the study of extraterrestrials and how to back engineer and weaponize anything that we've gotten that has come to this earth from them. And uh, that is, I think, where their interest lies is the fact that we have taken what was given to us and weaponized it. Yeah, you know, there is no, you know, the information that Tesla was getting yes. was not allowed to go to the public. No, no. You know, it, and and my good friend um, Tom Comwell and his his new book, where I don't know if you know Tom yet or not. If you don't, you will before much longer. Okay. Um, he has written, you know, they are here, UFOs, and he's documented regions of the country with the ship types and everything else. He's really fascinating with that. But his one of the sentences in his new book that just rocked my socks is capitulation by silence. The government allows the media to say everything with ridicule while revealing bits of the truth. Yes. And that's what's happening now. Yes, that's exactly, exactly, precisely what's happening now. And yes. so when I see what I'm seeing, I don't look in that direction. I start looking behind it, over it, beneath it, because there's something else going on. And Absolutely. You have to find the man behind the curtain. Yes, that's exactly right. And he's not a wizard. He's a coward. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, we, the people of this planet... Ha deserve to know the truth of everything that's going on, chances are very likely that we will never know everything, not from our fellow human beings. Right. If we know everything, it's because those that are really in the know that are truly protecting us will disclose it themselves. But you know and I know that they are not here to disrupt. And, you know, I don't know if I talked about this um, with you before, but I don't think that I have uh, sometime earlier in the year, um, you know, with all the upheaval and the right. sadness and the grief and the everything, um, I got called out in the middle of the night. Uh, and I know we're running short on time. I'll make this brief. But I was awakened in the middle of the night and I went outside and I just looked up into the sky and I said, what, what? And all of a sudden I had a flash of being 12 years old and living at the farm and being with my mother and my father and my sisters. And they had, my parents had taken us 
to a local chicken farm uh, just across the border in Connecticut because uh, mom wanted to buy fresh eggs. And we went into the part of the farm where the chicklets were allowed to be born. And one of the eggs was moving and I could see a little tiny beak coming through the egg. And I was absolutely fascinated. And I said, and I reached out to touch the egg, to break the egg, to let the chick out of the egg. And my mother stopped me and pulled my hand back. And she Uh. said, no, honey, you can't help the baby be born or it will die. Well, I was absolutely mortified that I had almost killed a baby chicken just out of, you know, the best of intentions. And that was the flash that I got, something that I had not thought of in 45 years. And what they were trying to tell me is that they can't crack our egg for us. The amount of energy that is required for that baby to peck its way out of its shell and enter the real world, the multidimensional world of its of its existence is equivalent to the amount of energy that will be required to live outside the egg. They can't do it for us. They're here to help us save ourselves from ourselves simply by making their presence known so that we know we are not alone in the universe and that we are loved. And thank goodness. Yes. Thank I them. Mean, yes. Because, you know, I, you know, and I know we have so many friends in this field of study. And the authors that are coming through this, you know, are writing books that are considered fiction. And it's actually very, very great that they're getting stories out there that, probably our past histories Mm -hmm. and you know there's so much talk about an awakening you know you can't you can't have a conversation with anyone interested in this topic without the awakening coming up i think that's great and ariel in chat says yeah that's called free will yeah and and you know what people have the free will to remain absolutely ignorant yep and a lot of people choose that a lot of people choose that and that's fine uh you know because the time will come when they too see the true nature of our reality and our existence not only in this world but in this universe and they will flock to those who do know about this in droves and it's up to us to be prepared to be ready and to retain our our empathy and our human compassion because some of them, I'm sorry, but some of them are just too stupid to live and yet they live and they deserve to be heard. You know, their point of view on this, even if it's, you know, you people are all lunatics that, you know, go out and hug trees and worship the moon and, you know, uh, You don't have any basis in reality when, in fact, we're the ones that are really living into our fullest reality. And they're the ones that are relegating themselves deliberately to live in a Mm three-dimensional, five-sensory realm that is a fraction of the truth of our existence. Well, I'm going to tell you that if anybody has, like, an active third eye that's that's having any kind of block you can't ignore that no you can't ex- you cannot ignore your extra senses because they make themselves known to this day i still can't sleep with a light in because it makes my head hurt right between my eyes <laughs> and yeah when i was five years old my grandma was like that's crazy and i said no she said so you have a headache i said no it hurts my head right here on my eye yeah, my, my other eye, the one that the light hurts. Yeah. And I remember that, and it's always been that way. So, you, you know, you can't hide from it for long if that is what you're meant to experience. That's and right. you know what? We are slap out of time. <laughs> I can't believe that I it does that every time we talk. I know. It went so fast. I'll come back, I promise. I I just look forward to that. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, the books... House of Darkness, House of Light, 
full trilogy. Read every one. You will not regret it. They are just fantastic information about Andrea and her family's experience. And The Flicker, written with George Lopez. Brilliant book. It is on your seat. Oh my God, what did I just read? Kind of a read. Don't read it if you're going to be alone in the house for days. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, and now got the movies in the works. And I'm so excited for you and I'm so proud for you and I love you thank you for being here I love you too sweetheart Merry Christmas Merry Christmas to you too and all of yours yes Hi. and again thank you everyone for joining in you know y'all are the reasons that we do these shows and I will be joined next week by Jamie Men's House and with Felix Martin I'm very excited about that and Y'all have a great week. Have a great Christmas. Thank you for supporting us, our network, and my show, and everyone else. And thank you for making us be able to be on iHeartRadio. We're very excited about that. Take care, and see you next time. Same cat channel, same cat time. Good night. <laughs>